Hello, I've not been happy with the quality of the recordings I've been making whilst working at my desk. Take this for example, from my previous video where I build a floating boing ball. It could be clearer and sharper. Now, for those videos I'm currently using a Logitech Stream Cam, which can record at full HD at 60 frames a second. It's what I'm recording this with right now, but its auto focus for desktop isn't great and as you can see even when it's in focus it doesn't look very good. So I want to replace it with something. If you take a look at Big Clive's channel and his videos, a great channel and worth checking out, he uses the same top-down approach and I believe he films and edits everything using a normal phone camera. It works great for his videos, but I don't have a spare phone lying around, so I need a different approach. I looked at maybe using some kind of DSLR camera, but for the resolution and frame rate I want is just way beyond my budget. So I started looking for other alternatives and came across the Cisco range of video conferencing cameras. Now I specifically wanted something with an optical zoom, and as luck would have it, Cisco have discontinued several cameras that are perfect for my needs. The one I'm looking at is the HD 1080p 4xS2, and it has a 4x optical zoom, outputs at 1080p, 60 frames a second via an HDMI connector. Powers from 12 volts and can be controlled by the Visca protocol. Now I'll explain a bit more about that later. The camera also has a motorised pan and tilt function. Because they're now discontinued, they're sold off very cheaply on eBay. So I purchased one. So in this video, I'm going to use an Arduino and a few extra bits to see if I can build a standalone controller for this camera, which I will then use in later videos. So now it's arrived, let's take a look at it. It's quite large and a little heavy, but it's actually quite solid. I'll power it up and see what happens. That's interesting. While initialising it resets itself to the centre. I'm going to quickly capture its output so we can take a look. Haha, <laughs> no laughing, it's a quick test. I've got it connected to a USB 3 HDMI capture device, and it's successfully capturing at 60 frames a second. Now, on the back of the camera there's this range of connectors. Starting from the bottom, there's a USB connector that, whilst detected, isn't very useful to us. The 12 volt supply, this seems to idle around 500 milliamps. The HDMI port, and Finally, this strange connector that I think for these is normally an extra bit on the side of the HDMI cable. This is used to send control messages to the camera, but seeing as we don't have that cable, let's take the camera apart and attach some wires to it. So first we have to get those rubber feet off, and sure enough there's screws hidden underneath. I don't think they want you inside this camera because these are strange hex screws, but no problem, I have the tool for that. Now, being careful to open as I don't know what's inside and what's connected where. I can see a flat flexible cable going between the two halves going from this connector. So I'm going to open that up and remove the cable. Now the two halves are separated, let's have a look at the base. Well, there's not much to see here, most is hiding under the metal shield, but we just want the connector underneath, so I'll have to remove the PCB too. Four more screws and we're in! Here's a close up of the connector I'm interested in. Now there's five pins on this connector, two of these look instantly interesting. These two appear to go off to some resistors. Now I don't know if these are pull up, pull down or just loading the line for impedance matching purposes, but I'd be surprised if these aren't the data signals. So I'm going to power this up and take a look. Please excuse the footage from the microscope, it's not the best. It looks perfect on its screen. So working our way around, it looks like we possibly have a 12 volt, a ground, minus 5, another possible ground, and maybe a ground again, but I suspect that one is the data pin. I'm powering off the device now, and I'm checking for continuity from the board between these two pins, and sure enough, they're both ground connections. So looking at this, there's two potential data connections, a 12 volt and a ground, which should be perfect. Now, this data connection being minus 5 volts, well there's two possibilities, it could be RS485, as there's a pair, and two pins would be opposite each other. But there should be a pair of these for each direction, one for transmit and one for receive. So it's more likely it's a proper RS232 signal at RS232 type voltage levels. I've mentioned the Visca protocol at the start, and if we have a look at Wikipedia we can see it's a communication standard designed by Sony for pan tilt and zoom style cameras or PTZ. It's a communication based on RS232 at 9600 board, 8 data bits, 1 stop bit, no parity or flow control. Now anyone that's played with an Arduino before will have seen boards like this. This will send and receive serial data from the computer, but it isn't actually true RS232. The TXD and RXD pins are actually digital signals between 0 and 5 volts, or 3.3 if you move the switch. RS232 on the other hand, while sending the same data, doesn't use the same voltage ranges. It uses signals that range from minus 3 to minus 15 for one state, to 3 and 15 for the other. 
This possibly explains the minus 5 volts we saw on the camera's PCB, and suggests that that might be the transmit signal. However, this isn't going to be friendly for our Arduino, so we need some kind of logic level converter. And look what have it! After rummaging around in a box of chips I had, I stumbled across several MAX3232 ICs. It's not the only type that will do what we need, but it just so happens that I have them. Here's the datasheet. By adding just a few components, this chip can convert between our Arduino TTL levels and the proper RS232 levels for us. This chip actually supports two pairs of signals, two for receive and two for transmit. The second pair could be used for things like hardware flow control, but we don't need both. So that should sort out the communications, and we can hopefully use the connections on the camera's PCB to power the Arduino too. So, I'll make a small hole in the case to allow our new control wire to exit, and then add some wires to the camera before screwing it back together again. Ready for a montage? it to our MAX3232 IC. To make this easier to manage, I've soldered the chip onto a piece of strip board with its required components so I can use it as a breakout board. But before we can try this, we need to understand more about the VSCA protocol. Thankfully, Cisco were kind enough to provide a PDF with a list of all the commands their camera supports, which just leaves us to implement them. And they explain the protocol in some detail. Basically, you send a series of bytes terminated with character 255, or FF in hex, and the camera responds with a message again terminated in FF hex. So, with this in mind, we should be able to control the camera. The simplest thing any program should do is a Hello World program. So, what's a Hello World program for a camera? Well, looking at some of the commands available, the simple and most obvious thing I could do is to control the call LED, which is a small LED at the front of the camera. So let's have a look at some Arduino code. The first thing you'll notice is I'm using the software serial library. I don't want to use the built-in serial port because it will interfere with us programming the board. Plus, it's helpful for debugging purposes. I've created this struct that we can use to send and receive commands and responses to and from the camera. The LEN field isn't strictly necessary due to the terminating FF hex byte, but it will make things easier. I've then created a simple function that will exchange commands with the camera. The first part writes our message, with a flush command causing the program to freeze until all the bytes have been sent. Then, in a loop, I read back one byte at a time and store them back in the buffer. But just in case there's an issue, I've an inbuilt timeout. Finally, when an FF character is received, we exit with a rough guess to see if the received message was valid or not. In the setup function, we just need to prepare the software serial port. And finally, in the main loop, we'll send the command to the camera using the above function. Wait 500 milliseconds, toggle the flag and send it again. And with that pushed to the Arduino, and pins 11 and 12 connected to the breakout board I made, the camera LED blinks on and off perfectly. Well that proves I can communicate with the camera. Now I'm not going to go through all the commands here, but I will implement most of these commands on the pages of this PDF. There's no point in implementing commands the camera doesn't support, right? I decided I want a proper controller for this too. So I'm going to need a few extra bits of electronics, starting with the LCD panel. This one is 16 characters wide, 2 rows, and is controlled using I2C. There's several libraries available already to control this. 
This is an analogue joystick that you can also use as a push button. This is a shaft encoder, and I've covered these before in my real-time voice repitch video. And finally, this little pile of push buttons. I'm hoping to be able to load and save six different states or presets, and I'll use these buttons for that. Now the joystick is really easy to use. It outputs the voltage on the two pins, one for the Y axis and one for the X. So as long as we know the voltage when the joystick isn't being pushed, we can work out which way and how much by reading the values of these using the Arduino. And here's some code for the joystick. I've connected the X and Y from the joystick to the two analogue inputs of the Arduino. And I start the program by calculating an average of the current joystick position, which on startup is most likely to be at its centre point. With that in mind, we can now read the joystick value. Now the joystick actually seems to have a small area that its resistance doesn't change over, but to reduce its noise, we're going to prevent the function returning anything until the value is changed by a value of 5. And I've put some test code in the main loop function. This sends the values out of the serial port in a way the Arduino IDE can use and plot on a graph, which I can now show you working. It works exactly the same as I did before with the voltage levels. So, this just leaves the LCD panel. And I'm using this version of the Liquid Crystal I2C library because some of the others don't work properly. And I know it's old, but the linked newer version in GitLab isn't there anymore. The library is actually very easy to use. With the library included, you simply need to declare it along with its I2C address, the number of rows and the number of columns. Then you simply initialize it, clear the display and turn the backlight on. And writing text to it is as simple as setting the start position and sending some text. I've created a few functions to display text and numbers to fill a specific number of characters, filling the remaining space with space characters, and this little sketch runs like this. Simple, but works well. Now I also want to create some kind of progress bar that I can use to show the current value of something, so I've created the following functions. Now I'm not going to go into this in too much detail here, but I am going to talk briefly about custom LCD characters. Each character is made up of 5 columns and 8 rows, and as the pixels can be on or off, they represent a bit mask. So for example, to create the custom character of the letter R, you simply need to create an array using the Arduino binary notation to define the character. Where there's a 1, a pixel will appear. Now the LCD panel only supports 8 custom characters, so you have to use them carefully. And here's the gotcha. After you create a character, you need to call set cursor or home or any further prints to the screen will write to the character memory. I believe this bug has been fixed in some of the LCD libraries. And with all the custom characters, you can create a nice progress bar effect like this one. Or, if you fancy being really posh, you can create one that supports going negative and positive. This isn't meant to be a tutorial, so I'm not going to cover all of the code or what I've built, but I did discover something interesting, like some of the documented camera commands don't actually work. Some of them you can set, but then when you query their value back, you get nothing. I guess someone was being a little bit lazy. Anyway, I need to build everything into a nice box, and Tinkercad is actually quite good when it comes to using off-the-shelf components. They really help you get a feel for how a design should be, and getting measurements correct. But, even with this, due to things like printer nozzle width and layer height, it still took three prints before I was happy with the results, and even then it wasn't quite right. As I've written all the code for this, which you can find in the video description, the only thing I need to do now is wire it all up. This is the circuit diagram I'll be working to. Pressing any of the preset buttons will load a preset, and pressing one whilst holding down the preset save button will cause it to be saved. Most of this is fairly simple. The only complex part is the MAX3232 chip, but I've already built the breakout board for that. So, let's assemble all of this in the box I've printed.
great assembled, but on powering up the camera nothing happened in the controller. It seems that whatever that 12 volt pin in the connector is, it's not meant to supply any power. So time to open up the camera again and connect that 12 volt wire directly to the 12 volt pin on the input barrel jack. With that fixed, we can finally do some testing. So I've suspended it above my desk like the old camera, and you can see the control box underneath. And I'm going to play around with the various options. The nice thing is, when you zoom in, the picture quality is still very sharp. You gotta love an optical zoom. Well that turned out really well. Now I'm not expecting anyone else to build one of these and in fact the final 3D printed designs weren't perfect at all and a little bit of sanding was required. Also, and I think you'll agree, it's a bit of a mess inside the control box but it does what I need. Excluding the next video or so, from now onwards until I find something better I'll be using this to make my videos. So let me know in the comments if you think this quality is better. I hope you found this interesting, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.